So welcome to everyone and welcome to the students that are there tonight. I'm going to kind of on the fly change my talk a little bit. Uh, I'm going to use the basic talk I was going to give, but hopefully I'll also give you all a sense of what our practice is about and what we do at the Zen Center. Um, there's actually two parts to my talk tonight. The first part, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Buddha's birthday, since it is celebrated in the Western cal or on the Western calendar on the eighth day of the fourth month, which is April 8th. In Asia, Buddha's birthday, his death day, and his enlightenment day are all celebrated on the same day. And that's the eighth day of the fourth month of the lunar new of the lunar calendar. So that's often in May is when that's actually celebrated. Um, but so I want to talk a little, little bit about the Buddha himself. And then I also um, again, you don't you all who are visiting don't have the background of this, but we have just completed the first three months of the year which in our tradition is uh, marked by 90-day meditation retreats. There was one that ended, um, I guess, last Friday in, in Providence, Rhode Island. There's another one that was ongoing in Europe, um, in different places all throughout these three months. And our temples in both Korea and in Hong Kong have uh, Kielce sits, but they do theirs from uh, sometime mid-October through mid-February, I believe. But it's very traditional in a Buddhist community to have these three months periods of intensive practice, followed by three months of what we think of as looser practice. And I'll get to that a little bit um, after I finish with uh, the birth of the Buddha. So just a little bit of history, again, for those of you who may not know. But it's it's believed that the Buddha was born, oh, we, we say about 2,500 years ago. I think maybe it's about 2,600 by now. And um, archaeologists are not sure of the exact date. In fact, uh, a, a very interesting tidbit is I was watching a documentary one time at the, about the life of the Buddha, and what they claimed is that in Asia, they really had this feeling that Buddha was a, was a mythological figure, that perhaps he wasn't really an incarnated being, human being. Uh, but Western-style mind likes to dig into those things, and... Uh, one of the byproducts of colonialism were the British being in India, and their archaeologists started searching, and lo and behold, they found artifacts and what they considered proof that the Buddha actually did live and did exist uh, in India and Nepal at that time. So this time period, about 25, 2,600 years ago, was a time of change all over the world. We think of ourselves as the modern ones, and we think of those ancient times as the old days. In, in my mind, in a sense, I could even believe they still lived in caves. But actually, by 2,500 years ago, societies had advanced, and um, there was a cities were growing, societies were growing, technology was growing. And people were going through difficult times, maybe in some ways the way we are today, that they we're in a period of change. And um, as we watch our own world, the old ways seem to hold on. There's a lot of tension now with, with new and old and belief systems and ideas. And very often in human history, these religions and, and ways of thinking grow out of that creative tension of change. And in many ways, you can say Buddhism is predicated on change. 
Buddhism is in many ways predicated on this sense of impermanence, that things are always in flux. And as a basic premise, we could say human beings are not actually very comfortable with impermanence and with this ever-changing um, life that we live. So we do our best to try to control it and in, in many ways stop things from changing. One of the ways we sometimes talk about it is the Buddha talked about suffering, and he said we suffer either because we don't have what we want, or we have what we want and we're afraid to lose it. So either way, change is difficult for us. So the story of the Buddha was that he was born into a wealthy family uh, in some stories, and, and maybe this is the way it's mostly considered. His father was the ruler of a small kingdom in what we now think of as northern India and uh, actually parts of Nepal. So um, I was looking at something the other night, and the ways that births tended to happen in in those days in in that place that we now call India was that the woman who was pregnant would go home to her family to give birth and then would come back to her married home after the birth was done. So um, the Buddha's mother started to feel that she was getting ready to give birth and she left the palace and was traveling to, um, to her home when she was in a field and she was too late and the Buddha was born or this baby Shakyamuni or Gautama or Siddhartha, there are many different names for him, but he was born in this field. And um, the, the entourage decided there was no reason to go back to, the, to his mother's family, so they went back to the temple. There are myths about the Buddha's birth that I'm not even going to bother getting into. But one very important fact is that soon after they returned to the temple, the Buddha's mother died. And it was actually his aunt, and I believe it was his mother's sister, but I'm not positive about that. But it was his aunt who raised him as his mother. So why I think that's a very important point is because all of traditional Buddhism is premised on this idea of suffering and the release of suffering. And actually, Buddha was this young boy who became Buddha, was born into suffering. I mean, we're all born into suffering because that's the way of the world. But the Buddha lost his mother very early. And that, that's a piece of the story that's not talked about too much. But I think it's a very important fact because we know now with some understanding of, of psychological factors that this deep suffering is almost born into his bones because he was so young when he lost his mother. So when the Buddha was born, there were some wise men who made these um, prognostications about the life of this young boy. And what they said was basically he was either going to be a great political leader, which is what his father wanted, or he was going to be a great religious figure, which his father absolutely did not want. And why I think this is important for our discussion here tonight is because what happened is his father started hatching a plan to encourage him to be a great political leader and discourage him from being a religious figure. Now, what I'm going to say is in a way quite preposterous, because what, what the Buddhist father tried to do was prevent him from seeing any suffering at all. He wasn't supposed to be able to see old age. 
He didn't see sickness. He didn't see death. And he didn't see poverty. He lived a life which he was pampered. He was given everything he wanted, all the best food as he grew older, all the best sexual experiences. He was pampered into believing that he was the special one. Before I go on to how the story goes on, I want to make a particular point here, which is, in a sense, the Buddha's father hatched this preposterous plan of trying to shape and create a life that would create the kind of outcome that he was looking for. And to do that, he really had to shelter his young son in place. He couldn't leave the palace because outside the palace, his father couldn't control the circumstances. So the story goes, into his late 20s, he hadn't left home. He hadn't really left the confines of the palace, or when he was very young, when he did leave the confines of the palace, he was protected and, and held separate. So on one hand, this sounds preposterous, but on another hand, it's actually the story of our own lives also. If you think of your own childhood, we're all born into a very particular set of circumstances. Each one of us is born into a unique family. And even if you have siblings, let's say you have an older sibling, once you're born into that family, you've changed the constellation of the family. So over time, families change. But each one of us is born into a very unique circumstance that has a socioeconomic position. It has a particular kind of neighborhood. It has a particular kind of culture that encourages certain things and discourages other things. And... I don't know about you, but when I think about it, think back to my family upbringing, my parents had pretty strong views on what they wanted me to become. They were very clear that they wanted me to have an education. They were very clear about the kinds of work they wanted me to do. They were subtle, maybe more subtly clear, but they encouraged certain aspects of my personality and they discourage other things. The outcome of that is that out of that gets created what could be called simply a false self or a creation of who we are that matches our circumstances, not necessarily matching our own inner needs and, and um, predilections. And on top of this, once we're born, it doesn't take very long for us to figure out the dynamics around us. I looked this up once, and, and the people who study these things believe by about six months old, the child has figured out what they need to do to get their needs met. And the, the little six-year-old baby begins to act in ways that will get what they need and what they want. So in a sense, from that very early moment, the child begins to create this false self to get itself satisfied. And the longer this goes on, the farther and farther away we find ourselves from what we might call a true nature or some kind of authenticity. So with the story of the Buddha, he started to get these inklings that something was wrong. So he colluded with one of his attendants to, in the night when people in the palace were asleep, to jump over the temple wall and go see what was happening, not the temple, I'm sorry, the palace wall, 
and see what was happening outside in society. And on each successive nights of these journeys, this young man began to see human suffering. He started to see that people grow old. He started to see sickness. He saw a corpse. He realized that people actually die. And then it said that he saw some religious figures who were already trying to train in this process of finding authentic nature. And each night that he took these um, illicit journeys, if you will, he began to become more and more uneasy. And finally, he did something that, just imagine how hard it is to do. He gave up all his wealth, all his future prospects, his wife, his young child, which was who was just recently born. And he did what people in India were doing at that time, some of the people in India were doing. He left home and went on a search to find his own nature. So for us in this lifetime, we actually find ourselves with a similar problem. We've been trained to be something. We've picked up the cues that our families, our neighborhoods, our societies show us how we're going to get our needs met. But we pay the cost of leaving ourselves, in a sense, turning, a back, uh, turning our backs on our own nature and becoming more artificial and in my mind, actually more brittle and more tight because we're fabricated rather than actually just being alive and present and being able to respond to what happens in the very moment that we find ourselves. So this young man began to do the practices of the day to find himself. And the way the story goes, he had this great awakening. He had this epiphany. And he found that there's actually a way to train ourselves to deal with suffering, to train ourselves to find something authentic and real in our lives maybe to quote some poetic phrase, to be able to break out of the life of desperation into a life that's alive and present and free. And what's come down to us in this day, 2,600 years or so later from the time of the Buddha, is actually a practice. It's less a theory and less a belief system, and more an actual practice. I guess in our day and age, we might even call it a technology to work with our own minds, our own hearts, and our own suffering in community with others to be able to touch back in to that authentic life that was lost. So I said that we've just ended a three-month period of what we call tight dharma, where we had a couple of weeks of a, a two-week-long meditation retreat. We had another um, three-day meditation retreat. We had a one-day meditation retreat. We've had all these dharma talks, all these practice periods. We've intensified our formal practice of sitting more days or more hours. There were some people in Rhode Island and in Europe and in Asia who just sat every day from like five in the morning till 9.30 at night following just a meditation, chanting, and bowing schedule. But for all of us, we've tightened our practice. 
we ask this deeper question, what am I? What is this? And then we just wonder. Again, remember I said, we humans are afraid of impermanence, afraid of change. When we sit and breathe deeply into our lower abdomen, as Marshall instructed us tonight, we get more stable. And face to face, we meet this impermanence. Rather than pulling ourselves away, we move closer. Again, in the meditation instructions, Marshall used this word intimacy. This not knowing practice, this deeply going inside, breathing into our lower abdomen, bringing our energy down, allows us actually to become more intimate with the moment. And the more intimate we can be in this very moment, the more possible it, it is for us, for our nature to leap out and become alive. So we use this word enlightenment. Lately, I've been changing a little bit to enlivenment, to become alive in this moment. So especially for you, you who are at the Zen Center tonight because you're here on a class, um, a class assignment, Leave with the with the understanding that what Zen is about and all of the things that happen at a Zen center are about waking up and becoming fully alive, fully present in the moment, and fully able to respond in an organic, open way to the ever-changing process of life that we have to deal with. So I have to go quick. I want to just I want to talk about one more thing and I'm going to I'm going to skip forward, but I want to again I want to give you some tools that you have to work with. So now that we're in what we call the loose dharma period. Um I was thinking about this phrase kyolche is tight dharma, heije is loose dharma. My teenage mind hears loose dharma and I think, oh boy, we don't have to try too hard. We get to relax, kick back, maybe go to a few parties. I can really just loosen up. But that's really not what Heijay means. In the olden days, Heijay was the time that the monastics left the community. They left the, the retreat center, if you will, and they went out into the the everyday world of their community, and they interacted with lay people. And they were there to teach lay people and to help lay people. So it's not about relaxing and partying. It's about loosening the boundaries and interacting and practicing this more direct, alive experience. How can I be of service right now? So if I can say two things that are important to life during this Heijay period, the, the first is to remember what we call the Bodhisattva path. What the Buddha taught actually is that when we focus too much on ourselves and our own needs, we become self-centered and we use the world to satisfy our needs and we actually end up creating more and more suffering for ourselves and others. But if we live our lives in service of making this world a better place, then we're not so self-centered. It's not so much for me. It's for all beings, for this whole world. And that shifts everything. So... If you want to practice the Buddha way, you practice in a way that's oriented towards being helpful to the world rather than being grasping and satisfying of my small desires and needs. So that's 
the orientation of our lives. And one of the Zen masters in our group from Hong Kong, she came up with this very handy five-step five step tools and reminders for how to actually practice moment to moment, day in, day out. She calls it A, B, C, D, and E. So it's a very easy thing to remember. It's an acronym. So A is awareness. O A is become familiar with this moment, not my fantasy about what it is, but what is it right now? When you see, when you hear, when you smell, when you taste, when you touch, what is it really? So find your, and B is breath. Find your breath. Marshall said in his meditation instructions, we focus our Zen meditation on our breath, breathing in and bringing the energy down into our lower abdomen, slowly breathing out and letting ourselves become connected to this world that slow breathing in and slower breathing out calms things down a little bit and it helps us find our center which is which is c awareness breath center stability feeling yourself in your lower abdomen rather than being so much up in your head or really your energy going out into the world, it's helping to bring our energy down and we become more centered and available, less afraid, less needing to change things and more ability to be with. D is don't know. There's an old Zen phrase which says, not knowing is most intimate. Again, that intimacy word. Our ideas, our beliefs, our desires actually separate us. This not knowing actually brings us closer. If you think you know something, you don't really have to pay attention. But when you recognize you don't know, then immediately following that is some curiosity and some wonder. So this not knowing is an antidote to the creation of mind that we, su we all suffer from. And the last one is E, which is effort. It takes effort and energy to stay present, to actually be alive. So awareness, breath, center, not knowing, and effort. If you can remember those five things, then you have a practice to return to, no matter what it is that's happening in the moment. If something happens and somebody does something you don't like and you get angry and your energy starts to fall away and you lose your balance, take a breath. What just happened? Oh, okay, I can feel myself again. What? is this? And then how can I try? And if we meet the world with those things, our relationship to the world changes, and there's a real possibility for something different to emerge in our lives. Not the insanity of doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get a different result, but not getting it but an ability to move with the energy of the world and to find something new and fresh and alive in this very moment. That's the promise of Buddhism. That's the promise of Zen. But it's nothing that anyone can give to you. You can't get it out of reading books. You have to do the work yourself. It's the most important thing I can tell you. It's not about anybody giving it to you. You have to find it. You have to do the work. Thanks for listening.